I'm going to share my screen. Look, John, you don't hear that music playing outside. Oh, I actually, <laughs> very <laughs> so damn loud. <laughs> doing? I think it's like a birthday party. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, I can. Perfect. Oh, now I hear. Yeah. Sorry, y'all. There's like a birthday party going on outside, so occasionally you'll hear this lady screaming, wait a minute. Never mind. <laughs> Sorry. Keep going. All right. Well, guys, let's get started. Um, this is the final exam review part three. So we're going to cover the rest of the material that we were going over in class. And Sebastian is going to take it away and start with DNA replication. Yeah, let's do this. <clears throat> All right, so if at any point um, you guys want me to slow down or reiterate something, I'm going to be try to checking out the chat. Um, if I do miss like a comment or something, feel free to just unmute yourself and interrupt me or whatever. I'd be happy to repeat myself or to clarify something. Um, but anyway, let's start with like the basics, DNA replication. Um, so DNA is composed of nucleotides. All nucleotides have the same structure. They all have a nitrogenous base, um, a sugar, and a phosphate group. That little cartoon there at the bottom left is a good representation of all the, um, uh, of all the parts that go into nucleotides. We'll, we'll get into a little more detail um, about, you know, like, a, like the three prime and five prime and what exactly those do. Um, but at a very basic level, all nucleotides just have the same general structure, and that's that right there. <clears throat> okay, so nucleotides, of course, compose uh, DNA. They attach to, how do I say this? They, nucleotides attach to each other going, I guess, not, not vertically, but... Um, I don't even know what I'm trying to say. Uh, they form a strand, but in addition to forming a strand, they also base pair with each other. So there's like two different connectivities that are happening. There's base pairing via phosphodiester bonds, which again, I'll talk in a little more detail about. But in addition to the phosphodiester bond, which are covalent bonds, by the way, they also hydrogen bond with their complementary base pair. And again, this is still... Um, this is still like super superficial stuff. So don't worry if you have like questions just yet. I will of course be going into uh, more detail about this later on. But the takeaway from here is um, uh, AT bonds form two hydrogen bonds, whereas the GC form three hydrogen bonds. And that's, that's, a, pretty, uh, that's a pretty popular question. So for instance, something that uh, you might see that I think I saw on a final once was, um, uh, it was something like you're trying to uh, or this enzyme is trying to cleave the, um, the, the DNA, which, uh, like which part of the DNA will have like the most success at cleaving it. And it gives you a picture of DNA and it shows you like a bunch of different base pairs. And obviously the, the part of the DNA that would have the most success at cleaving would be the AT section, uh, like the Tata box, for instance, um, because there's only two hydrogen bonds to cleave, whereas the other ones, there are three hydrogen bonds. So that's just like a, a typical bio question that you might see floating around somewhere. Oh my God, I can hear you, bro. Okay, so this is a, a little more detail about the, um, about the nucleotide, uh, but essentially it's the same thing. So you still have the nitrogen space, you still have your sugar, and you still have your phosphate group. Okay, so now going into more detail about this. So notice that the ring is of course numbered. Um, if you remember from Orgo, all of the carbons have a, a directionality to them. On the three prime, that is where 
the five prime nucleotide is going, or I'm sorry, that on that three prime carbon where you see that hydroxyl group, that is where the next nucleotide is going to be attached to. Um, that is why uh, the directionality of nucleotide addition goes from five prime to three prime. It cannot go from three prime to five prime um, because that confirmation just will not work for that reaction to be catalyzed, for that phosphodiester bond to actually form, the direction or the orientation of how you're placing the nucleotide does matter. Um, so that's why we go from five prime to three prime and it cannot go the opposite way. Any, qu sorry, any questions so far about anything that I've said yet? Okay. <laughs> um, a little more detail about nucleotides. You have your purines, uh, pyrimidines. There's a bunch of different um, ways to memorize these. I like this one that we have at the top left corner, the pure is gold. Uh, purines are the adenine and gold, the, the guanosine. That's pretty good. I've heard a bunch of different kinds of ones. I know Laura had a, a pretty good one as well. I forgot what it was, but um, I don't know how important the detail is going to be. But of course, this is an open note exam. So if you ever need to like refresh on something, you don't need to go like super hard and remembering all the details here because again, the, the notes will be accessible to you. Um, but just so you know, nucleotides are classified as either purines or pyrimidines. Um, and I think the difference is, what was the difference? I think it was just the, uh, like the, the, the steric cluster of the nitrogenous base, I believe. Yes, that is the difference. Okay. Okay, cool. And I think that um, the purines, you can see like structurally, they have the extra nitrogens and the hydrocarb, like that double bond. Mm. And then the pyrimidines only have the one carbon ring with the nitrogens attached to it. Cool. But we just have more base pairing slides, but I'm just going to skip over those if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Unless, unless anybody like really wants to continue talking about <laughs> base pairing, but. You know. Um... Okay. Um, all right, so replication. Um, and again, if you guys have any questions about anything that we covered before, I know we jumped over like a couple slides, but again, if uh, you have any questions about any of those, feel free to interrupt me or email me later. Um, okay, definitely something that you should bear in mind is that DNA replication is a semi-conservative process, meaning that um, when your DNA starts replicating, it uses one strand of your DNA as a template strand, and that template strand is used as a template to synthesize the new strand, hence the semi-conservative part. Only half of your original DNA is being conserved in that process, and I think this picture does a good job at illustrating that. That is also another very popular multiple choice question. It's like, which one of these processes um, uh, emulates DNA replication? And it would be like full conservative or non-conservative, semi-conservative, whatever, things like that. So again, definitely uh, keep this process in mind. Okay, so um, as you guys probably know, the DNA polymerase is the, um, the protein responsible for adding the nucleotides, again, it adds them in the five prime to three prime direction. Um, that's the only way that that reaction will be catalyzed. Oh, um, I, I think it's worth mentioning. We, we might have skipped over, but it's totally okay. Um, that connectivity, the, the, when nucleotides bond from the five prime to three prime direction, that is a covalent bond. That's called a phosphodiester bond. And that is a pretty, um, it's a pretty tough bond because obviously you don't want your DNA like falling apart. You don't want the backbone of your DNA like easily crumbling. Hence why you need a, a solid covalent phosphodiester bond. You do want a strong bond there. However, with nucleotide bonding, so when the two strands come together, that's when they do utilize hydrogen bondings. And the reason for that is because obviously DNA needs to be replicated. It needs to be able to be unwound and then come back together again. So I'm sure you can imagine if you have a very, very strong bond, like a covalent bond, holding uh, two strands together, it's going to be extremely difficult for the helicase or for other proteins to um, unwind the DNA and start the synthesis or 
gene replication or whatever. Um, so you don't want your DNA backbone falling apart. Hence why you do need a strong bond. Hence why you need that covalent phosphodiester bond. But you do want to be able to unwind it if you need to uh, you know, transcribe something or you want to replicate your DNA. So that's why it's easier to use hydrogen bonds. They're weaker bonds, they're easier to unwind. Um, so bear those in mind. There are two kinds of bonds going into this, hydrogen bonds and covalent bonds. Anyway, going back to this. Um, so the DNA polymerase um, attaches nucleotides to each other in the five prime to three prime direction via phosphodiester bond. Um, but in addition to that domain, um, so if you think back to one of the first lessons that we talked about, proteins can have one domain or they can have multiple domains. The DNA polymerase has a domain where that domain is responsible for adding the nucleotides. It has another domain that's used for uh, proofreading. It has a proofreading mechanism. So on that illustration on the right-hand side, you can see um, that Pac-Man looking thing is adding, that's your polymerase, it's adding the nucleotides in the five prime to three prime direction. Um, let's say for instance, it accidentally adds the wrong nucleotide. Um, that's where its second domain, the exonuclease, um, plays a big role. When the polymerase detects that it accidentally put the wrong nucleotide there, it will use that exonuclease activity. Um, exo meaning like at the end of something. And again, as you can see there in the diagram, it is, uh, it's cleaving that nucleotide or it's removing that nucleotide at the end of the DNA. This will probably make more sense when I uh, talk about the difference or when I talk about endonuclease, which is slightly different, not like terribly different, but slightly different. Um, so the takeaway from here is uh, the DNA polymerase, in addition to the uh, nucleotide addition domain, it also has an exonuclease domain, which is responsible for removing that nucleotide. Any questions about this? Okay. Uh, okay, yeah, this is, um, this just reiterates what I said before. Um, one domain is the polymerizing domain, like you can see on the left-hand side. I just realized that's a hand, <laughs> that's funny. And on the right-hand side, right-hand side, sorry. <laughs> on the right, that's the proofreading domain where it has the exonuclease activity. I'm sorry, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, there's this. people in the waiting room. Oh, no, you're fine. But yeah, go ahead. I got everybody in. Okay. <laughs> Keep the train on. I'm getting, like, text updates <laughs> about, like, what's going on. Wait. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, so, like I mentioned before, when the DNA polymerase is adding nucleotides, if it detects that it put down a wrong nucleotide, it will use its exonuclease activity to remove it and place the right one, and it'll continue going. Very rarely does the nuclease um, overlook that mistake. Um, it's typically very, very good at catching those mistakes, but sometimes the DNA polymerase can gloss over a mistake and not, uh, not detect that. So, in that case, there's obviously going to be uh, a mismatch, you're going to have a discrepancy in the um, cohesiveness of your DNA strand. Um, it'll be a pretty noticeable mistake. The cell can detect that pretty easily. And there's a whole mechanism for that kind of repair. That's called the mismatch repair. Um, it's very efficient. It's a very powerful tool. Um, and we'll talk about a little bit more in the next slide about what goes into that. Okay, so Notice on this diagram at the, well, the diagram on the left-hand side, but on the top, on the, uh, excuse me, diagram on the right, but on the top left hand of that diagram, you see that a uh, little bubble forming. That little bubble is due to the hydrogen bonds not being able to form because obviously if you put in the wrong nucleotide, um, instead of having an attractive force, you're going to have a repelling force, hence why that little bubble is there. So that little bubble is just um, where the mismatch was, where the misplaced nucleotide was. Um, when the cell detects that there is a mismatch, it's going to travel a little upstream from that mismatch and it's going to create a nick. So it's essentially going to cleave that covalent phosphodiester bond. When it does that, as you can imagine, there's a whole series of proteins to go into this. Um, there's a whole cascade. Um, 
a whole cascade of proteins that go into repairing this. Um, one of those proteins is responsible for making the NIC. The other one is responsible for bringing those together. And when it brings the NIC to the DNA mismatch, so to that mismatched um, nucleotide, it's essentially going to remove the whole thing. Um, I wish I had like a good analogy for this um, or something to compare it to. I don't though, but it's essentially going to fold the DNA bring the mismatched nucleotide to the neck and is going to cleave the whole thing together. So there's going to be a huge, um, a huge stretch of nucleotides just missing, which is fine because then the polymerase can come back and it could just repair that, um, repair that site again. Oh, um, what was I going to say? Um, this, so that nick after the mismatched nucleotide was detected, like I said, uh, there's a protein responsible for creating that NIC so that the DNA could fold in itself and remove um, that stretch of nucleotides. So what creates that NIC is the endonuclease activity. Endo meaning like inside. Um, so just to keep the differences in mind, an exonuclease is when you remove a nucleotide at the end of your newly synthesized, excuse me, of your newly synthesized strand or from whatever strand an endonuclease is when you um, remove a nucleotide or uh, cleave a nucleotide within the strand. So any difference between those? Okay. I'm so sorry, I was muted that whole time. Were you asking me? Oh, no, I, I, I was just asking in general, <laughs> like if anybody um, had any questions about this. Okay. Um, there, is a, there is a difference in the mismatch repair mechanism between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Um, I don't think this will be a tremendously huge part of uh, your exam, but just to go over the differences, um, Obviously, each uh, between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, there are a cascade of proteins required to fix that mismatch. Um, but the differences are, um, um, they're, they're not tremendously different, but they are slightly different. So prokaryotes, uh, they, do need, uh, they do need a little bit more going into them only because they are uh, like less complex cells. So they do need a higher level of, um, or not a higher level, but a, uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Um, they, they do need more proteins involved to get that uh, to get that mismatched nucleotide repaired. Whereas eukaryotes, um, they are more complex, but they are more sophisticated as far as um, adding nucleotides and repairing that mechanism. So there isn't a tremendous amount that goes into that um, because again, the level of eukaryote DNA synthesis is much more complex. It's much more unlikely for there to be um, a mismatched nucleotide, but the mechanisms do parallel each other somewhat. Okay, any questions about um, anything that I just covered so far? All right. Okay. All right, guys, so I'm going to take over talking about recombinant DNA technology, which is the stuff that we basically covered on like the last week of class. But um, I can't really see the chat. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to just stop me and ask. Yeah. I'll be checking out the chat. Awesome, thanks. So just as an overview, so you're trying to move your DNA around, you must be able to do like a few several things. So you need to identify the DNA that you want you need to create and extract the DNA that you want, and you need to have a way to move the DNA into the cell so that it can be expressed or maintained. So a way to do this is by using DNA vectors. So those are the small pieces of E. coli DNA, and they're referred to as plasmids. So plasmids are vehicles to move around foreign parts of DNA between cells. And they can be from 3,000 base pairs long and hold genes that are up to 20,000 base pairs long. And the vector, something that it must have is an origin of replication so that the organism will keep reproducing that gene. 
An example of this would be like an E. coli plasmid having an E. coli origin of replication. So a vector must also have something called a selection marker. So to expand on selection markers, so as the DNA moves between the cells, the cells receive vectors. So they must, there must be like some way to differentiate which cells receive the vectors and which cells did not receive the vectors. And they do that by having the selection markers. So they give an organism a certain phenotype and based on that phenotype, you would know whether or not the plasmid was inserted into that, the DNA of that molecule or cell. So an example of this, again, like E. coli, she likes to talk a lot about E. coli. Um, they have antibiotic resistance that they can use as a selective marker when they're inserting plasmids into different cells. So now we're going to talk about restriction enzymes. So restriction enzymes are used to splice different genes that are we really cloned like together. And by, in order to do this, they need to have a restriction digest and ligation and they do ligation via DNA ligase. So it goes in and like cuts the DNA. So they also use restriction endonucleases like the endonucleases like um, Sebastian was talking about earlier. And these act as DNA scissors that are sequence specific. So they go inside to the DNA and find the cleavage site and they would act as like scissors here and cut like there can either be blunt ends or sticky ends. So these would be blunt ends, and then these would be examples of the sticky ends after they were cut. And then there are also restriction enzymes for other bacteria that have been cloned and expressed for DNA recombinant technology. So these are just like steps of how to splice together a clone gene to a vector. So the first step would be to cut your plasmid with a particular enzyme. So that would be like the cleavage site here. And then it would be cut. And then once that cut piece of DNA is going into the plasmid, it would have to go in with the same restriction enzyme. So then the mixed, the cut gene and the restriction enzyme will have to be mixed with DNA ligase. And the cut ends of the plasmid will find one another and then DNA ligase will come and seal them via phosphodiester bond. So the phosphodiester bond is like the bond from the DNA backbone. It's like a really strong bond and it's creating that backbone to make sure that it doesn't break again. So the minimal requirements for this to happen are you need an origin of replication, you need restriction enzyme sites and a selection marker. And then this is just a picture that she had from class that has like different sites of different genes that are used as selection markers and also as plasmids. So we're gonna talk about gene isolation. So the goal of gene isolation is basically to obtain the gene that you're trying to clone, like your gene of interest. And we do this by sourcing the gene of interest and then doing a polymerase chain reaction. And these are just a couple of sources that you guys can use to watch videos just for further explanation. So this is sourcing your gene of interest. So you need a plasmid with a gene, you need a genome of the organism, and you need the genomic DNA library organized into plasmids. So this is just, this picture over here is just an example of like the different steps that you would go to, to be able to find your gene of interest. So now we're gonna talk about PCR or polymerase chain reaction. And the goal of this basically is to take a gene and unravel the DNA from that gene and replicate it just a bunch of times using heat. So to prepare for this, you need a complementary strand of DNA. So it has to be five prime to three prime anti-parallel. And then you need DNA plasmids and DNTPs and the DNA polymerase for the reaction. And then you have to thermal cycle it. So here is the template DNA and then you take one strand of your template. And then this is the primer 
which is supposed to be five prime to three prime and complementary to the template over here and here. And then this is where it gets tagged by TAC polymerase. And when it gets tagged by TAC polymerase and it goes through the thermocycler, it replicates itself. So thermocycling. It usually goes through about 20 or 30 times and it creates millions of copies. So you usually create temperatures based on your primer so that your primer can anneal. And these are just like examples of like generally what it is. So like the denaturing would be at 95 degrees Celsius and that would break the hydrogen bonds. The annealing, which would be dependent on the primer would, which is usually like 50 to 65 degrees, which optimi optimizes sequence specific pairing. And then you want to raise the temperature up again, which is optimal for TAC polymerase, which is a protein that was actually found in the hot springs. And it is able to withstand high temperatures. That's why it's used in the thermocycler. And then once you add, then you add the restriction enzymes to get the gene vector. And to do that, you add the restriction site plus the extra DNA. And this allows for replication. And then you cut the PCR product into a plasmid and this complementary overhangs to ligate together. And this is just kind of like a picture of that. So here you see your PCR product and then you have your plasmids and they get digested and the, those two ligate together to form here. So now we're gonna talk about complementary DNA, so or cDNA, and it's an isolate from MR, mRNA from gene to reverse transcribe the gene. So this is when you take your template strand and then you find complementary bases to that, which would be your mRNA, but then find the complementary bases to that, and that would be your cDNA. It's very confusing, but it's basically the same as the template in theory. And the procedure to do this would be the affinity chromat chroma chromat chro wow, I can't say that. But anyway, that. And <laughs> collect the mRNA via poly A tail. And then you incubate and re use reverse transcriptase to make the cDNA from the mRNA. And then you incubate that DNA with DNA polymerase and terminal transferase to create double strands with strand tails. And this is just a picture of that whole process. So here is when you incubate and use the reverse transcriptase to find the complementary cDNA from the R mRNA. And then the cDNA is completed, it gets hydrolyzed, and then it incubates the DNA polymerase and synthesizes the second strand. And this is how it all comes together. So once you have your PCR product, you wanna read it, and you usually read that through gel electrophoresis. And this is just a way to visualize the DNA. So it uses an agros gel matrix that the DNA fragments will move through. And basically what the idea is that the smaller pieces of the DNA will move down farther into the fragments of the gel. And the larger pieces will stay up towards the top and not be able to move towards the gel, move through the gel as easily. So in order to do this, you need a piece of DNA for sequencing, a primer that is adjacent to the area that needs sequencing, DNTPs and DDNTPs in low concentrations. So here are the DDNTPs here. You see it's one for cytosine, guanine, adenine, and tyrosine. And then those go into the DNA. And then using the fluorescence, it shines through and you see, or there's a photomultiplier that multiplies the DNA strands. And this creates light for each different nucleotide. Almost like polypeptide. So just a little bit more about sequencing. So 
out of the million of polymer, millions of polymers that are synthesized, you want to find the DNA that you're using as the template. So the DDNPs, like I was talking about before, are D-deoxynucleotide triphosphates. And every once in a while during the synthesis, like the DDNPs and the chain termination will occur. And that basically creates polymers that are a certain length. And we can test that they're that certain length by running it through the gel, just like we ran the PCR through the gel. And this is called Sanger sequencing. And the sequence of the DNA template is then derived by finding out the DDNPs and how they were incorporated into your sequence. And the DDNPs, there can't be too many of them, and there also can't be too few, and it has to be very random, because if not, then you may not get accurate results. And then, yeah, I think that was my last slide. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Well, we are going to post this on the class YouTube and we're gonna send out an email with the slides on it. And if you guys have any questions, you can email us or email Laura. I know that she is watching her email like a hawk, but thank you guys for coming. I appreciate it. Bro, can you hear her? <laughs> Dude, this lady's still yelling. That's crazy. Oh my god, this sounds fucking lit. I'm gonna.